This is the FYI on Youth Ministry, a youth ministry podcast from the Fuller Youth Institute. In this episode, we talk with Father Greg Boyle about compassion, love, and kinship. But first, let's hear what young people had to say. What is compassion? Well, I guess giving something to someone. Compassion? Um, For me, compassion is a very strong word because I've used it so many times with my friends. When you're being compassionate about something, you're not like having like pity for someone because you much rather understand having compassion for me it's sort of like just having empathy but um i'm sure that empathy is like a much different like concept of having compassion for something or for someone Hello everyone, this is Rosalyn Hernandez. I am Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Manager and Content Producer at the Fuller Youth Institute. And I'm Giovanni Panginda, and I am the Social Media Lead at the Fuller Youth Institute. But I'm also a youth and college pastor on the weekends. And in this episode, we're actually gonna take a look at compassion in the kinship of Christ. That's right, and we are so honored to welcome Father Greg Boyle to the FYI on Youth Ministry podcast. Father Greg, or G, as the homies call him, (laughs) is a Jesuit priest. He served as a pastor of the Dolores Mission in Boyle Heights from 1986 to 1992, and in 1988, he co-founded what is now Homeboy Industries. Some of the books he has written are Tattoos on the Heart, Barking to the Choir, and The Whole Language. Father Greg, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. So much of the way that you relate what you've learned is through stories. So I'm wondering if today you can share a story with us about one of the first things that you learned about compassion that a young person taught you. Oh gosh, I don't know. I have so many stories. You have homies who come through there who have have records and have done things. And uh, so it leads you to believe something that's quite radical I think about human beings that everybody's unshakably good mm-hmm. and but they're caring a great deal and so uh, and so you stand in awe at what they have to carry rather than in judgment they're juggling so many things kids and the job and cars that don't work and they have to choose between literally feeding their kids or or taking them to the doctor uh, homies are always uh, uh, presenting, you know, the degree of difficulty there is in them navigating their lives because uh, they've had to carry more than I ever had to growing up in the same city. Mm. That kind of reminds me of how as um, leaders in the church maybe, or as youth leaders, we think that we carry more than maybe young people do that our students might carry, but you're mentioning people that are younger than us are also carrying a lot of stuff. Yeah, I mean, if you keep in mind that no hopeful kid has ever joined a gang in the history of the world. And uh, t- today I was talking to a homie who, uh, you know, he's been shot, he's, he limps with a very pronounced kind of limp. I said when he came in, I said, how did I get so lucky, you know, to have a son like you? And then he said, he kind of sighed and he said, oh, I wish my dad could say that to me. And I said, well, but you know, the truth is, you're breaking the cycle with your kids, you know, and have compassion with your father, because, you know, he clearly is carrying pain and, and perhaps trauma that he visited on you. But you have, you're in a place now, in a, you know, and you've reaped the benefits of a, a community of truly you know, cherished belonging. And he's been able to arrive at a kind of healing that he can now, you know, present a certain kind of sanctuary to his kids that wasn't presented to him. I love that. Um, I want to backtrack it a little bit. I want, I think, the listeners to get uh, on the same page about compassion and kinship. So, uh, Father Boyle, how would you define compassion and how would you define kinship? I I was at Folsom Prison as a chaplain, and I also taught a course because I have an MA in English, so it's short stories, and and there was a story by Flannery O'Connor, and A Good Man is Hard to Find is the name of the story. And so they were using interchangeably 
uh, sympathy, empathy, and compassion. So I said, well, what's sympathy? And one guy said, uh, sympathy is when you hear that your homie on the yard, you know, they're talking about the prison, yeah. and, and his mom died. They say, I'm sorry about your mom. And I said, well, what's empathy? Well, another guy said, well, empathy is when, you know, you go up to a guy and say, I'm sorry about your mom. You know, my mom died six months ago, so I feel what you're going through. And then I said, well, what's compassion? And so it was calladitos. They were silent, and it was like, and finally one guy said, well, compassion, that's entirely different. That's, compassion is what Jesus did, he said. And then he said, compassion is God. But that doesn't define it still. That just sort of identifies it a little bit. Yeah. But the homies will say, you know, find the thorn underneath. We're trying to create a community of kinship, not a behaving community. So we're not tripped up by behavior. The compassion is, is finding what's, what's underneath stuff. So, you know, we draw lines, us and them. They behaved badly. They don't belong to us. Uh, they're not in my camp. That's the other camp. But compassion says, you know, what's, you know, what's going on here? And it's the opposite of judgment. And, and it's, you know, demonizing is the opposite of who God is. So you decide not to do that, of course. I love that. Um, it kind of reminds me of kind of my own story, like uh, immigrating to America at the age of four in, in 1990. And, um, you know, as part of my story, I don't think as an Indonesian American, <laughs> or at least as an Indonesian at the time, I don't think I would uh, survive the immigration process had it not been for some of my neighbors because there were times when my my mom and dad were like struggling trying to find a sitter you know there would be uh some of my friends parents would be like come over come over to our casa you, like my neighbors became like that kind of family um so that my parents could do their you know work um and so my mom knows how to make sopes and tamales, and um, we drink champurado in December, like an Asian family drinking champurado, right? Yeah. And in turn, they they know how to make um, fried rice and egg rolls and like um, all these other uh, Indonesian and Asian foods because of that, you know, uh -huh. exchange. Yeah. And so I think like it's that compassion that. Uh, my neighbors had for us being like a newly immigrated family. This is the, what God had in mind. It's God's dream come true to have kinship and connection. And, yeah. <laughs> and that's where, where we're called to say, no, no, that's okay. Well, come on in. Yeah. Welcome. I'll, you know, I'll teach you how to make tamales. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, and so that's kind of a, that's a beautiful image. Yeah. Um, can we talk a little bit more about a young person and their relationship to uh, kinship uh, towards Christ? I'm 37 and like I get to, to say what I said because I get to look back. Had I been a young, young person then, you know, how would I think about Christ and my relationship or kinship to Christ? Um, the Christ in me recognizes the Christ in you. Mm. And so the idea is uh, to see Jesus and to be Jesus. Mm. In the end, it's about uh, living as though the truth were true and putting first things recognizably first. So this is a self-effacing God who's, who's going, no, it's not about me. It's about what I'm, I hope you will create, you know, in terms of, of the kinship of God here and now, where people connect. So, I mean, again, this is a rap that Christians at the moment have, a bad rap, you know, that it's, uh, that it's hypocritical. It's not about kinship. It's about um, who can we exclude. Yeah. It's not about diversity, and it's not about equity, and it's not about inclusion. It's about camps, and, and you're not one of us. Yeah, so talking about that, I mean, you and everyone that works at Homeboy Industries, there's diverse people there. 
Um, and there are people who are even from opposing gangs or people that don't meet eye to eye on certain things, um, but they soon begin to see each other as homies and as familia and as kin. What's the secret sauce, right? Like what happens <laughs> that, uh, that makes these people who are not, um, who are diverse, who come from different backgrounds, who have different perspectives, what makes them become kin? You know, first of all, our program is not for those who need help, it's only for those who want it. And it's like an AA meeting, you know, who's at an AA meeting? Well, there's people who are 20 years sober, and there's somebody who's 20 minutes sober, and there's somebody who's drunk, but they're there. That's kind of what Homeboy feels like, because people are at different places. And then you create and a, a, a place that's safe. That's where you begin. That's sort of part of the secret sauce. And then people are seen. You know, homies from prison especially will say, I'm used to being watched. I'm not used to being seen. Mm -hmm. And then once they're seen, they can, they're vulnerable enough to be cherished. And cherishing is the whole thing. Initially, what you really want to do is welcome them and thank them for being there and, and set them up. So anyway, but the point is, what always works is not the hard message, but the, um, the care that they felt immediately and the fact that they, I know they felt seen. But you learn that lesson over and over again. Cherishing people is not hard. Remembering to cherish people, that's difficult. So that's part of why you practice, that's why you pray. That makes me think of in youth ministry, Sometimes we have students that come in with their walls up or, you know, there's might be some attitude problems or sometimes I think, oh, no, that student that like sometimes speaks out of turn in class or is defensive about things. And what I hear you saying is we need to cherish those students. We need to cherish all our students, but maybe they need it the most. Coupled with that, I... I hear a lot of like that cherishing and compassion for students, right? And students that, um, or people just in general that really need it and that's why they're hard on the outside. But I think also whenever we give that cherishing or that compassion, we need to know what it's like to be cherished ourselves. So when it comes to self-compassion and self-cherishing, how do you find that for yourself or how do you would you recommend that someone find that for themselves or give themselves those practices of self-compassion yeah that's a good question you know the the um i saw someone with a shirt uh, the mica um act help me out act justly love mercy walk humbly Humbly, yeah and um but it said love mercy but there's another translation that says love goodness which i like better um because it's you cannot love, I can't love goodness in you unless I recognize that I have it here. And once you know that everybody's unshakably good and that we belong to each other, you can receive people. You know, you can allow your heart to be altered by people, which is the whole point of ministry. I, I was taught for one semester by Henry Nowen at Harvard Divinity, and he uh, did a... Uh, it was a course on ministry. At one point, somebody said, what is ministry? And he was kind of in a bad mood. But he said, can you receive people? I remember him saying that. And, and we don't think of ministry that way as receiving people. We think, you know, pay it forward, make a difference, uh, give back and to the rescue. But he just said, can you receive people? And I thought, yeah, that's it. But you can't receive people, you know, um, if you have not made friends with your own wound, then you're going to be tempted to despise the wounded. And, and that's what happens with the kid who comes in and who has an attitude. But it is the relationship that heals. So you want to stay anchored in it. It's not the information. It's not the content. It's the context. So they all come in barricaded behind a wall of shame and disgrace. And the only thing that can scale that wall is tenderness. Homeboy is the front porch of the house everybody wants to live in. But you want to communicate that to the world, to say it really could look like this, where everybody believes that every single person is unshakably good, no exceptions, and that we belong to each other, no exceptions. Team
teenagers in your ministry care about their world. This is why FYI has developed Compassion from the Inside Out, a four-week high school youth ministry curriculum so you can equip your students for a lifelong journey of faith-filled compassion. Cultivate compassion with your students through powerful discussion guides, interactive prayer and reflection activities, social media tools, and so much more. Compassion from the Inside Out will empower your teens to make a difference in the world. Find out more at fulleryouthinstitute.org slash curriculum. How could a youth leader or how could a church connect with other organizations in their context and in their community to work on creating a broader sense of kinship and of compassion where they live? Yeah, well, I think, you know, part of the thing is even in volunteerism, you know, you, you have that as, as part of every, you know, youth ministries. So you don't want to immediately give people stuff to do. You want to say, dive in, talk to people, ask them their name, you know, listen. And then always, does that always work? Yeah, it always works. And, but in the end, it's all relational. And so you're arriving at this relational wholeness that's um, therapeutic and, and, it's, and everybody is becoming healed in the process. That also kind of reminds me, and you kind of touched on this, that we serve people, but we're not really giving them something. And I think sometimes we have that like white savior mentality, right? Mm -hmm. of, oh, we have something better or we're in a better situation. We're going to go help others in our community. But you're saying, how are you going to change of, out of having a relationship with these other people that you are, um, in the end, sure, helping, but the change initially starts with us when we're going to serve, when we're going outside of ourselves to go meet in relationship with others. Yeah, so the goal is exquisite mutuality, you know, of course, where there is no us and them. So service is the hallway, but it's leading to the ballroom, which is kinship. So don't stop in the hallway. And, and I, I kind of wish we would retire, you know, uh, giving back, pay it forward, make a difference. If I said those things, it would all be about me. Mm -hmm. And it can't be about me. So you don't go to the margins to make a difference because then it's about me. Mm. You go to the margins so that the folks at the margins make you different. Now that feels passive. It feels like, no, I need to give them stuff. No, what, what happens is you go there and suddenly your heart is altered and suddenly you've entered this whole other place of mutuality. So I had a homie, a Latino covered in tattoos and I gave a talk. He came up to me afterwards and he said, how do you reach them? Meaning gang members. Mm -hmm. And I found myself saying, well, you know, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? Well, that sort of turns everything on its head. But it also, it is the antidote to burnout. You won't burn out. Because then it's, you're, you're being reached by people. You're receiving people. But if it's about me fixing, saving, and rescuing, and then it's depleting, and then you're burnt out. But unless it becomes tender, you know, there's no connection. And, and that's what, you know, that's what the hope is. So uh, a couple of years ago, I actually got to um, sit down at um, Homeboy Industries uh, to watch one of your meetings. I remember just how, like, well, kind of fun, like it was. Like it was just very, like, loud <laughs> mm -hmm. and fun. And um, what I left from it um, was this feeling of hope and joy. But partly because in the beginning, I think you got you, you all do something like celebrations. Is that like something that you y'all? Yeah. So it's also ritual, you know. So yeah, it begins. If I do it, you know, yes, announce the day. You know, yeah. it's, it's August fourth, and then. Uh, so I have a list of who's been assigned. So Mario, where are we standing? So he comes up and he reads yes, the, the land that, acknowledgement. Yes. And then, then it's birthdays. And then who are our providers? Dr. So-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. Big applause. 
um, going in order. Then the curriculum, so someone comes up and say, the class, the special class of the day, we have lots of classes, but then they highlight something. We announce, you know, who's the case manager of the day, therapist. Yeah. And that's a beautiful moment because people will be very funny. They'll say, please stay inside today. We think it's, oh my God, what? Because Shamita just got her driver's license, you know, yeah. and everybody goes yes. nuts. Yes, yeah. You know, or, or someone will say, you know, I got my kids back and people are sobbing. Mm. Yeah. No, I, I love that because it's a, it's a ritual, it's a practice, it it's is fun, fun and it, it, it gives who we are, like an identity of, of homeboy and, you know, collectively too, the sense of belonging, like just, oh wow, like you guys can really be real, you know, with yourselves and even in front of like people who are just there for the yeah, meeting. Yeah, and, and there's a kind of call and response, you know, so, yes. so they'll, they'll say, yeah. please silence your cells. <laughs> and then everybody yells, and yourselves. yourselves. One of the reasons I also brought it up is because it, it felt like home, because especially in my, in my church, in my youth group, that's something that we actually do before we even start church. There's like that kind of sense of, of liturgy and um, camaraderie. And, yeah. um, and ritual. You ritual. ritualize yeah. some things. Yeah. Do, do you have any other like spiritual practices that you might want to recommend to like young people? Yeah, yeah, I you know, at Homeboy, you know, it's uh, we do have the prayer, and when it started, you know, when we first started to have morning meetings, which we didn't have until, you know, maybe fifteen years into our thirty-five years, mm -hmm. hey, lead us in a prayer. And and I remember some guy started this thing, <laughs> where he says, "Everybody bow your heads," <laughs> and and now for you know, yeah. twenty years. Everybody begins the prayer that way. And then they pray to the God of the alarm clock, you know, thank you for waking us up today. Yeah. <laughs> and it, there's a kind of, sometimes there's a roteness, but it's, it's always beautiful. People are terrified to speak in front of, yeah. you know, and they ask, they kind of ask different people. Yeah. Hey, do this, you'll be fine. Just a real brief. So you've modeled it. Yeah. No, I, I remember that day specifically just because um, it was our tour guide. She, she was the one who was asked to pray and she was like, are, are you sure that like me like you don't want me to pray and then like but she prayed and then the rest of our our, our like a uh, tour group was like you got it girl you got it <laughs> <laughs> that's great you know yeah and so it just reminded me of that kind of like childlike faith so to speak you know and it just brought me back to my own students and just like um sometimes they're like shy like that and um as soon as the rest of the group kind of affirms them um they 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 come out but like we're very also strong. very yeah. diverse you know so we have atheists and muslims and mm. and buddhists and uh every variety of christian denomination yeah. so there's a kind of a i mean people can pray however they want to pray sure and uh you know uh, richard Rohr always used to say only the false self is is offended by anything <laughs> so then you're not offended by anything you yeah. just go how rich this is you know, and nobody's being forced to, to pray a certain way or to believe a certain thing. And, uh, you know, I like that. I think that's as it should be, you know. Uh, what I'm hearing in there, too, is the sacredness of the everyday things. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, making a practice, making a spiritual practice out of maybe complimenting someone or affirming someone yeah. and that uh, cherishing someone in a, in a particular way or delighting in how they said a prayer or um, the way that they give an announcement. Um, and so I, whenever we think of spiritual practices, we might think of that, right, of prayer or um, reading the Bible or um, Lectio Divina or something like that. But what if we thought more of those, the sacredness in the everyday or the sacredness in the in the lived reality of our students and of our youth ministry and the, the things that seem banal but are so great for us to cherish with them. I think that's the whole thing. You know, you want people to connect to finding God in all things, as St. Ignatius used to say. And, mm -hmm. and so otherwise it gets too narrow. It, there's, here's the language you should be using. Well, why? We're allergic to, at Homeboy, putting the bar up and asking folks to measure it because our God doesn't do that ever. It's never about measuring. 
Instead, we hold the mirror up. I say, here's who you are. You couldn't be better. You could not be one bit better. I don't let homies talk that way. I don't let them talk about, you know, one day I hope to become a better man. I go, no, what are you talking about? You couldn't be better. Now, you may not fully inhabit, you know, your unshakable goodness, but it's untouchable. God isn't waiting for anybody to do something or to not do something. Too busy loving us. I've been thinking about delight and love and being cherished and even being childlike from, you know, when Jesus gets asked who's going to be the greatest in heaven. <laughs> and he says, don't worry about being the greatest, be childlike. And to me, it means a little bit of don't worry about being the greatest, just rest in, in the fact that God delights in you. And you use the word rest, you know. Uh, and rest is not sleep, you know. It's a, rest is anchor. Rest is groundedness. Rest is center. And, and once you have rest in that sense, then it's the place from which you can love. There's nothing more consequential than our notion of God that, that has gotten so twisted, you know. Yeah. And, and Meister Eckhart, who um, I've been reading a lot lately, and he, he says, it is a lie, any talk of God that doesn't comfort you. You were created because God thought this, you might enjoy it, you know. And then it becomes so much easier once we understand that to live with compassion. Exactly. And to extend the kinship. And to receive people and to, you know, to be a beneficial presence. Well, we have reached the time. What? No. Uh, no. Stop. <laughs> We're going for... <laughs> <laughs> well, at the time for our lightning round. Oh, okay. Oh, the way there's more. I'm sorry. There is more. A little bit more. <laughs> it's a fun bit. It's a fun bit. Yeah. Um, these questions are inspired by uh, interviews that we did for one of our research projects, which is called Character and Virtue Development Research Project. And um, these are entirely subjective. We're not looking for like a dissertation of any of, on any of these. This is just like the first thing that pops into your head, yeah. and it's a one word or a one sentence answer. Yeah. And we're not like Pharisees. We're not gonna like entrap you or anything. <laughs> you know, like, um, okay. <laughs> so are you ready? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you a little bit of time to think. No, no, it. go ahead. I am there. <laughs> okay. When you were a teenager, who taught you the most about love? Uh, my dad. Okay. What is the greatest lesson you've learned about forgiveness? That we shouldn't settle forgiveness. We f settle for forgiveness. We should hold out for mercy, which is uh, the father running down the road to greet his prodigal son. Okay. In the season of your life, compassion looks like? In the season of my life, like yeah. the four seasons? No, in this season, like in your age right now. So, so you're saying I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> so what do geezers think about compassion? I just, you need to be clear. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, because yeah, you do, you do feel, uh, you know, diminishment. And it's freeing and wonderful. And especially now at Homeboy, I step back so the homies can step up. So it's nice to hold... Uh, pass the torch to the new generation. But a homie who I did, I still told that to, and he goes, I just hope we don't set the place on fire. He <laughs> said, that's okay. You got this. Okay. Um, what or who gives you hope? Uh, the homies give me hope because, they, you know, they battle and they become uh, these just incredibly loving they inhabit their true selves, and they live from their truth. That's a very hopeful thing to observe. So this is a little bit of a trick question, um, but it's a really fun one. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being low and 10 being high, how much humility do you have? Oh, zero. <laughs> okay. Can you, do you want to explain oh, no, a little I bit? <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, I... I does a humble person answer that question? Yeah, that, that would be my guess. <laughs> That's that a good is answer. a trick question. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, I have no idea. We got a lot of fives and sixes. Oh, yeah, for that. yeah, because they think, oh, I don't know too much. I'm a little bit. Yeah, I get it. 
Okay, um, when something is hard, what is a practice that helps you persevere? Well, I, you know, I, I think God protects me from nothing, but sustains me in everything. So, you know, you just, I have a, a mantra person, so I'll have different mantras every day that kind of get me through so I can listen, so I can be attentive, so I, so I can be a one on that humility scale. <laughs> and not a five. <laughs> <laughs> what, which one was it? So, so ten was ten ver- was high. What, and meaning, we- meaning very humble. Yes. yes. Oh, that so that I could be a ten. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Well, um, this season we are asking our guests to help us wrap up each episode with a blessing. So, Father Boyle, in light of our conversation. Would you honor us with giving us a benediction? Sure. Loving and faithful God, I pray uh, that you bless all of us in this room and beyond and those who are viewing this. May you remind us of the truth of who we are, that we're exactly, exactly what you had in mind when you made us. May you fill us with the deep and abiding sense that you love us without measure and without regret. May you help us move our faith um, from our head to our heart and truly to our feet so that we can put one foot in front of the next and, and be in the world who you are, compassionate, loving, kind. May you teach us that kindness is the only non-delusional response to everything and that with kindness everything will change. And we make this prayer confident in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Great being with you. This podcast is one of the many free resources produced by the Fuller Youth Institute. You can find similar resources at fulleryouthinstitute.org slash blog or in your inbox if you sign up for our newsletter. Check out the show notes for links to all the resources mentioned in today's episode. And thanks so much for listening. Finally, here is one more thought from a young person. Do you have a moment or an experience when you felt compassion for someone else or when someone gave you compassion? I have a friend. I really didn't like her at first because I'm someone who's very quiet and she's someone who's like very talkative, very bubbly. And I'm like, oh, please don't start with that. And then at one point she told me her story of her life. And I was like, oh, no, you don't deserve me treating you that way. Like I hugged her and I'm like, I'm sorry. And I even wrote to her in a letter um, to not listen what the others have to say about her to just keep being herself. Mm-hmm.